Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show, or as it's now called, The Path of Longevity. And I'm your host, Dr. Robert Lufkin. Welcome to this holiday edition. Our co-host, Dr. Steven Sideroff, is off with his extended family to Hawaii for a well-deserved vacation. We want to express our deep appreciation for all those who've helped make this show production possible, including Chris, Tressa, Tatiana, Sue Young, Eric, Brandon, Alan, and many, many more. But most of all, we want to express our gratitude and appreciation to all of you, our audience who has made this possible. And now, since we're nearing the end of 2022, we're going to take this occasion to review the top five podcasts of the season. And coming in at number five is rapamycin and a carbos for longevity and practice, uh, where we interview Bradley Rosen, who's a, a telemedicine practitioner and a provider of rapamycin and other longevity services. Number four, rapamycin for longevity, patient experience. In this episode, we interviewed Greg Davison, who is a uh, self-described biohacker and also a patient who's taking rapamycin for his personal experiences of that. Number three, rapamycin, metformin, and fisetin for longevity. That's with Daniel Tofik, who is the founder and CEO of a telemedicine rapamycin provider platform. There seems to be a theme here. Number two, the fasting method with Megan Ramos. Ah, finally something without rapamycin in the title. But if you think about it, fasting has the effect of lowering nutrients and turning down mTOR or the mechanistic target of rapamycin, which is actually the same effect on health and longevity that drugs like rapamycin have, or at least a similar effect. Hopefully, if you're taking rapamycin, you're also fasting as well to get the double benefit of both of those. Finally, number one, our most popular podcast of 2022 is entitled Rapamycin for Longevity in Clinical Practice, and it's by the great Dr. Alan Green, who's one of the pioneers in prescribing rapamycin and has a very large clinical practice in the New York uh, City area. It was a wonderful interview uh, a while ago, but um, it's now my pleasure to replay the number one interview of 2022. And here it is. Please enjoy this interview with Dr. Alan Green. Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show with Dr. Robert Lufkin. Today, we're going to hear from the physician with arguably the largest experience worldwide in prescribing rapamycin for longevity. Dr. Green is a board certified pathologist currently specializing in the treatment of age related disease. He has an MD from the State University of New York Downstate Medical Center College of Medicine and a residency in anatomic and clinical pathology from Winthrop University Hospital. Now, rapamycin, also known as sirolimus or rapamune, is an FDA-approved prescription drug with indications for use for the prevention of organ transplant rejection and for the treatment of lymphangioliomatosis. Any other use is off-label. Rapamycin should only be used under the supervision of a physician. The information in this program is for educational purposes only and is not medical advice. Please also see our disclaimer at the end. Now, enjoy this interview with Dr. Alan Green. Dr. Green, it's a pleasure having you on the show. There's so many things I, I want to ask you about your practice, but maybe start off just uh, how you became interested in the study of longevity. Well. Uh, about the early, so like I, but just as I died, turned 70, it occurred, it seemed to me that I was sort of like having a very rapid decline of my health. And uh, based on the rapid decline, I thought I was going to be dead 
in a few years. Uh, and I mistakenly thought that I was suffering from aging. Uh, that was so I didn't know anything about aging at the time. So like most doctors, I had zero knowledge of aging, but I had like confidence that I could look up aging in a medical textbook and find out what I'd like to know about it. So I looked at a medical textbook and I was absolutely amazed to find out it wasn't there. I mean, I just, I mean, I was so flabbergasted. I was like looking through all these books, I'm looking at the index, looking at the table of contents. Aging is simply not there. And I'm like blown away by this. So then I decided to sort of like start studying aging on my own. And uh, I like the first thing I came across was the study that they did in like UK about metformin and that people taking metformin were living longer than sort of like, you know, like non-diabetics, non-metformin. Well, that was like, that was like amazing that that's anything like that could happen. Uh, so that sort of like got me like interested in that there might be something to this. And, and eventually I came across like Blagus Scaloni. Now I was just extraordinarily, extraordinarily impressed with Blagus Scaloni. He was the only person who was like making any sense. And Blagus Scaloni just had an extraordinary brilliant conception of the whole thing. So after like studying Blagus Scaloni's works for about like six months and studying everything he had to say, I decided is that I would try his sort of like formula of like rapamycin. He had like suggested taking rapamycin in his like uh, 2006 paper. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in all those papers since then, so this is sort of like uh, January 2016. Now, prior to January 16, in the sort of like paper that came out Christmas Eve, in 2014 by Jane Maddock, like that changed everything because prior to that paper, it seemed that you couldn't take rapamycin because it had an adverse effect on your immune system. Well, Jane Maddox has showed that, no, that was just a case of how you were taking it. When she gave it to people like uh, uh, once a week, a short period of time, like uh, she showed that she had an improvement and they're sort of like acquired immune system. They had a better response to like a like flu shot. So that changed everything. That meant that if it wasn't having a bad effect on your, uh, your IT cell function or acquired immune system, that made it safe. So I decided to sort of like try it. And uh, I like, you know, by going through black scores like papers, I decided to come up with a dose of say uh, six milligrams once a week. Because black score was real queer that it should be used intermittently. Uh, and Blagus Glory also had a paper in which she said that they gave a six milligram dose to volunteers and it had an effect. So like six milligrams seemed like a therapeutic effect uh, and that seemed like pretty good. So I decided I would just try that. I was trying to have like a high dose because I wasn't too concerned about side effects. I was much more concerned that it simply would not have any effect. I was not really expecting much of an effect. I had very low expectations. So I like started in like January of like 2016 and I'm going along and by like, you know, like three months or so, I am just blown away. I am like unbelievable. I like feel like I'm like five or 10 years younger. I am not suffering from any distress whatsoever. Prior to that, I had been suffering from severe, so like, uh, like, you know, definite like heart failure, like an early stage of heart failure. And then I found mild exercise, I would get like, uh, like signs of like heart failure, shortness of breath and other things like that. So now, but now I'm just doing unbelievable. I'm not having any symptoms whatsoever. I like pick up cycling, I'm riding my bike like a thousand miles a month. I'm like feeling fantastic. I just could not be sort of like feeling in better shape. Uh, so I'm continuous going along with that. And I feared, well, this is like the greatest thing ever. I can't believe how great this stuff is. The only problem is if you were in a position, you couldn't get it. So I feared like no, there, was, there wasn't any way to get it. So I feared, well, if this continues working in like really good, very good like this after a year, I will like open up a little practice because I'd already been retired for 10 years as a pathologist. Uh, and I had no intention of starting a practice. I just decided that I would make this available 
to a few people who were like studying all the sort of like the literature. They decided they wanted to use rapamycin, but they didn't have any way to get it. And they didn't really know quite how to use it. So I decided I would do that. So I just set up an office and like part of my house was like, so it's like zero overhead. And it was just set up for, to have a practice that I would see like, you know, like two patients a month. That was perfectly fine. You know, that was, that was the idea. No overhead, the two patients a month, who people who had like made a special, like were especially interested in this and wanted to try it, but they weren't a physician, so they couldn't write a prescription. So this was going on, the uh, uh, first patient in like uh, March of uh, 2017. Everything was going on great. And then like a couple of years later, uh, I have an opportunity to I have an echocardiogram. I have the echocardiogram and I find out I wasn't suffering from aging at all. I was like totally not suffering from aging. That was like totally not what it was. I had like an extremely rare cardiomyopathy. Oh, uh, huh. And that's what I had. And then I realized, wow, then, then it's like, real, I realized that's what my mother died from. That's what my grandmother died from. That's how there's no old people on the mother's side of the family. It was like an autosomal dominant cardiomyopathy. And that's what sort of like people like, that's what they had. Uh, they initially, they initially had both, I had presented with atrial fibrillation in my 50s, but there was no other finding. And both my mother and my grandmother, they had died from like complications of atrial fibrillation. But other people had died from complications, direct heart complications. So it was like real clear that that's what people had. It was like a very rare thing. It was like apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is like, it's like cardio hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is rare. And this was about 5% of those cases. So it was like, wow. a, but wow. it was like a, quite remarkable that it responded terrific to rapamycin, which turns out to be most of the whole hypertrophic cardiomyopathies respond to rapamycin because it doesn't doesn't seem to matter too much about what the initial genetic cause is. And they all have, there's a whole big variety of them. They have different genetic causes, but the common sort of like denominator at the end is they have, whatever is going on, they wind up with elevated mTOR. So mTOR stands for target of rapamycin. Uh, so they have elevated mTOR, and that's what's causing the hypertrophy. That's what's causing the fibrosis. That's what's causing inflammation in the disease process. Uh, so, uh, then, so that that was so that I, it was simply a case of complete luck that I sort of like wound up with this because if I had done the right thing and seen a cardiologist, the cardiologist would have done an echocardiogram and it said, "Well, you have this cardiomyopathy and." come back when you need a heart transplant. Wow. <laughs> there, was, wow. <laughs> there, was like zero, there was zero treatment available. So but uh, by then I was sort of like doing great. And, uh, and you know, I like it and to realize that rapamycin worked extraordinarily well in all sorts of things. Curiously, I found there was some other sort of like a patient, a couple of brothers who uh, had a, a, an addition, additional like a, a different extraordinarily rare cardiomyopathy, uh, lamin A cardiomyopathy. It's like, ne like I never even heard of it. They did great on rapamycin. They, wow. like, they, had, so they had been doing like, was like the one person, he was a professor. So he did some independent research and he found out that people were treating a mouse model that was rapamycin. So he wanted to try rapamycin. So he got, uh, he did people, he had very good medical treatment, but they weren't giving him, they wouldn't give him rapamycin. So I came, he had an extraordinarily good response and went back to like teaching full time. So him wow. and his brother too did like very, very well on it. So rapamycin turned out to be real, real good for hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. Oh, but, wow. But then I had like a very nice like practice and I realized it seemed to work for just about all sorts of things. It seemed to work for mostly all the age-related diseases that were especially associated with increased risk with diabetes. So if you had an age-related disease and people with metabolic syndrome, overweight people, diabetes had an increased risk, 
rapamycin worked with that because all those people they had they were they was all elevated mTOR diseases. I mean, there's going to be like a few other strains that are like a more unusual uh, age related diseases that don't have any that if you're if it's an age related disease and it occurred in thin people, it was less likely that the mice would work. But if it occurred in fat people, an increased risk that the mice was going to work. Maybe for our audience, you could um, uh, just go over some basic uh, fundamentals about uh, how what. How, how does dialing down mTOR as a nutrient sensing protein, how, how can it affect all these, so many diseases like that? Well, it affects all the diseases because it looks like all the diseases have a sort of like a common pathway because rapamycin is only doing one thing. It's, whole, it's only effect is to decrease mTOR. And if you can use it, depending on how you use it, it's decreasing mTOR1 or mTOR2. But it turns out that uh, mTOR is basically at the center of everything that's going on in the cell. Uh, so that's a peculiar thing. So mTOR has basically been the command and control of the cell for basically, seems like the last 2 billion years. Uh, and how I can trace it back to 2 billion years it's because it's in the plant world and it's in the animal world. And they can sort of like trace that that sort of like split between the one cell animal that was a common ancestor splitting into say like the vegetable world on the yeast side and the animal world and the protozoa side. That was basically 2 billion years ago. So- uh, Isn't so it amazing? Why, yeah, that we can see the we can see mTORs as a major signaling protein all the way from yeast to human beings, and and turning down mTOR has longevity benefits in every single one of those uh, animals right. and plants that it. It seems there was like a couple, but there was like two dramatic different effects. mTOR seems to want to like increase longevity by working on mitochondrial complex one. And that it seems to like work on there. And it see, and that seems to be in common with a lot of pathways. It seems like you can turn down like complex one with like caloric restriction or like protein restriction or methionine restriction or rapamycin. They all seem to have the same sort of like, 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 uh, Changing the mitochondrial function so that my, so that M2, so that complex one is less sloppy with N, with electrons to sort of like describe it in one sort of way. In other words, if it's like less sloppy with spilling ends with electrons, that slows down. That causes less DNA damage and slows down aging. That seems to be sort of like a common sort of like technique for controlling aging because when the other sort of like some of the very very slight top researchers i think it's like Borja or something like that like really the name of like spain he showed that that was what was going on it's like controlling aging and different different species in other words having like you had like a bird which is the same size as a rat and the rats living three years and the birds living 30 years and uh he was showing it was like basically it was like that mitochondrial function that was doing that that how they sort of like adjusted the mitochondria would affect like a dot affect the lifespan so that was one thing that it was like that mycin was doing but the other thing it was doing is just and turning down like mTOR mTOR aside from this direct mitochondrial effect was having a very adverse effect on just about everything as far as age related diseases for one thing, one thing it was doing very directly, it was causing increased inflammation. In other words, it was having a direct effect on what's called the innate immune system. Now, the innate immune system is involved with inflammation and like macrophages. It's not the acquired immune system, but, to, but that system and the overact response of that system seems to be involved and downstream, this like huge, all these like 
from like new nuclear factor KD to sort of like, you know, then uh, all these other factors, all these different factors, which are causing like inflammation and like damaging effects on all sorts of like diseases. It's turning those down. That seems so like, so there seems to be like a host of like the huge different things and they all seem to get involved in like diseases because uh, it's, uh, it basically started, I would say about 2010. Now prior to like in 2009, that was the first time they showed that rapamycin increased the lifespan of mice. So when it showed it increased the lifespan of mice and it showed that wasn't just decreasing cancer. They were, when they evaluated, they could see it was slowing down aging. That was sort of like the that was the general consensus of what it was doing. It was not just decreasing the, the mice's risk of cancer. It was really slowing down aging because it was affecting, they could see all the, and also they could see all sorts of other things like flies and worms that didn't get cancer. It was increasing their lifespan too. So it was having a, a real effect on slowing down aging. Well, now all the different like researchers started looking at what mTOR was doing in all the different diseases. Like none of, nobody was interested in rapamycin. They were interested in what's the, what's the pathway in these different diseases? What's, this, what's the actual like cellular pathway, the like molecular pathway, and what is sort of like mTOR doing and what happens when you turn down mTOR. So they're all using uh, rapamycin just to turn, just as a convenient tool to turn down mTOR so they can see what role mTOR is playing in all these different age related diseases. And basically almost all the diseases they're looking at, mTOR is in the middle of the disease. And basically uh, one of the sort of like top research scientists said, you pick any age related disease and you like, scratch it in the middle of it, you'll find mTOR. You'll find like mTOR in the middle of that disease, driving that disease, lowering mTOR, is like, it's like lowering like stuff in the disease. Uh, and that was sort of like going on with like, things you wouldn't even think of like that. Like, I mean, like things like osteoarthritis. I mean, I was like, thought like, you know, my impression is like a wear and tear kind of like thing. And it turned out they were showing it wasn't a wear and tear kind of thing. It was an inflammatory kind of thing. And if they turned down like mTOR, they would have, they would like these like very much improving the disease because they were increasing autophagy. So the cartilage cells were surviving a lot better. And they were decreasing the inflammation that was like destroying the hyaline cartilage. So it's like even like a thing like that. It was like amazing that a disease like that was a real an mTOR disease. Uh, and they said the same yeah. thing. About, yeah. Uh, and then it was like, basically it was like one disease after the other. That yeah, the, like, the, the degenerative changes. I'm a radiologist by training. So I, you know, you know, I was looking at all the degenerative changes over the spine and everything. And, and yeah, I, we were taught that, oh, that's just age related degeneration, you know, wear and tear, like you say, but, but the evidence now is, is that no, this is a specific uh, okay. inflammatory okay. process. Right. Yeah. The amazing thing regarding the spine is when they came up and showing that the spine was a senescent cell disease. Now there was that there was like it was like senescent cells that was damaging the cartilage, and yeah. it's it sort of like by reducing senescent cells in their sort of like animal model, they were sort of like you know reducing the like the this disease that was like it seems such a in other words it seemed like I mean my understanding is like well the disc is just dries out and it dries out and then it like breaks down. And, I mean, the idea that it was like an inflammatory senescent cells were actually sort of like dissolving the disc as an active sort of like process. It wasn't just, these things weren't just wearing out. They were being destroyed by either. And then the other, that's the other thing that was extraordinary. You had this whole like list of like 20 diseases that had been come together by being prevented, like uh, ameliorated with, Blowing mTOR with that mice. Then you had the senescent cell people, and they come up with like a totally different approach. They're like, if not, they never ever even mention mTOR in their studies. They never talk about mTOR. They just like looking for senescent cells. 
And they develop all sorts of like, they usually use testosterone for estrogen in half the studies, or half the studies that just come up with like their own sort of like thing to destroy Smith and cell in that area. And they're coming up with like the same sort of like a whole very long list of diseases that are being stopped if you if you remove citizen cells and you look at this list it's like it's the same list <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all, all diseases on one disease if the disease was on one it was on the other it's like no one had checked it yet but uh, they were basically all on the same list but the only sort of like big disease that wasn't on that list was alzheimer's disease alzheimer's disease because like in alzheimer's disease they were able to show in 2010, some like great researchers at sort of like University of San Antonio, the Bosch Health Institute, so sort of like one of the world's great research places. They showed that they could like uh, two different groups, they could prevent Alzheimer's disease and like mouse models of Alzheimer's disease in 2010. And they were continuously showing you know, like, you know, perfecting that different groups, different sort of like uh, models, everything else coming along. But so that was like the only disease that was like, okay, Alzheimer's disease is mTOR, it's not senescent cells. That was, so that idea was totally exploded in 2018 when they showed that the major cells driving Alzheimer's disease were senescent cells. It was like that they showed like, uh, like uh, Moosey from San Antonio. He was just like one of the people uh, the, the, the main, the first name on the state paper, they showed that the cells that everybody had been wondering about since 2006, the, the neurons with the neurofibrillary tangles, that no one knew what they were sort of like doing because on one hand they had neurofibrillary tangles, on the other hand they kept on surviving and they weren't like dying. He showed that they were senescent cells that they were senescent cells. And if you remove those senescent cells with the them, you stop the disease process. So that was absolutely extraordinary. That was 2018. And now San Antonio is doing an actual study with the them and actually treating patients with the same sort of like, you know, the uh, routine. But that But that was just the start of it. That was just the neurons. And ah. the same sort of like between 2018, 2019, they showed that the oligodendroglia, they came, uh, myelin, they were senescent, they became senescent cells. And the microglia was senescent and the astrocytes were senescent. The whole group of all the sort of like, all, all the players, all, all the, <laughs> of the whole gang of like the three different types of glial cells and plus the neuron with the neurofibrillary tangles were all senescent cells. Wow. Well, before we get into the senescent cells, and I really wanted that's very exciting. Just before we leave, uh, or before we transition from metformin, and uh, for our audience, I, we will link to all these important fundamental articles in the show notes, so everyone will have access to them. Um, on metformin, I mean, I'm sorry, on, uh, on rapamycin, the, um, you mentioned complex one, could you talk just briefly about complex one versus complex two and why we, why we dose, uh, why we don't do continuous dosing of rapamycin and no, what no, the no. thinking I'm is there? About, so I'm not talking about mTOR one or mTOR two. I was talking about complex one of the mitochondria. Oh, so okay. But as okay. far as complex one of the mitochondria, that's as far as I can go with it. I don't understand what's going okay. on with this. I should have like one, two, and three, and four. But that's, a, that's very, very complex. And that's sort of like the work I would say uh, like, you know, like Borja from like Spain who like showed that. But as far as like rapamycin, rapamycin has mTOR1 and mTOR2. Yeah. And that's the sort of like tricky, that's the sort of like tricky thing. It turned out when they introduced rapamycin in 1999 in transplant medicine, they had no idea about anything from anything. All they knew was that rapamycin was like you could give an animal rapamycin, it altered the effect of the lymphocytes. They didn't recognize a foreign organ, they didn't recognize a foreign kidney. You can do, you could give it and you could use it for transplant medicine. It was more, it was safer and better than the medicines they had for transplant medicine. And it had some side effects, but not a particularly sort of like serious side effects. 
But and and what they knew is that you had to give it every day. That was what that was the one thing that they knew that you gave it every day and you maintain a continuous high blood level because the, the half-life of rapamycin is about 65 hours. Mm -hmm. So if you give it every day, you're, you're just building up the sort of like blood level and you have a continuous high blood level and with the continuous high blood level, that worked. And they, I don't know whether they knew why that worked, but it turned out that other sort of like uh, researchers and cancer researchers figured out what was going on. And uh, another sort of like uh, one of the top researchers in 2013, uh, I think it's like, uh, I his name not right now. He like said, all the benefits in anti-aging are for reducing mTOR1. And all the harmful side effects were for reducing mTOR2. So if you just sort of like use it to sort of like reduce mTOR1, and not reduce mTOR2, that's all you have to do. Uh, and that's sort of like, so that was just sort of like key, that was just sort of like, it was like, you know, lambing, so like deadly lambing. So he's the one who came up with that idea in 2013. So that was, that was the key thing. The key thing was to realize that the side effects of mTOR2 and uh, benefits, the anti-aging benefits with the mTOR1. And they're both sort of like, they both are very, very different like compounds but they, you can see they're on the same platform. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. the same, like they're like related that way, but they're like not related as far as the function very much. The function is like quite different, different. And it turned out that mTOR2 was a thousand times more resistant to rapamycin than mTOR1. So when you just take a single dose of rapamycin, you reduce mTOR1 because mTOR1 was set up in the body to respond to everything, like food, this and that, because it was controlling everything. It was responding to mTOR1, was responding to everything. mTOR2 wasn't responding to anything. mTOR2 was just maintaining like a level of function of, of all these different things. De so you never wanted to decrease mTOR2. In transplant medicine, they introduced rapamycin to be a biologic poison. In other words, they weren't introducing it to do anything good for anybody. They were introducing it to poison the acquired immune system to alter the function of the lymphocytes so that they could do, put it in a foreign kidney and the body would not react to it, which is mm -hmm. a pretty deranged sort of like, like immune system to not react to a foreign kidney. But so that was, and, but why it turned out with like, it, they gave it every day is it was a case of if mTOR2 is already formed, the pieces are put together real nice and tight. Rapamycin can't jump into little spots. It can't like mess with them. But when you when the body has to replace mTOR2 continuously, and that'd be whether when you're taking rapamycin or not. So it has to make more mTOR2. In order to make mTOR2, it has to build the little parts and stick all the little parts together. And it can't stick the little parts together in a high blood level of rapamycin because rapamycin competes with some of the spots where the things go. So you can't assemble a, a, a functional level of mTOR2 in the presence of a continuous high blood level of rapamycin. So when, when they use it, they have like a, a level, you know, a continuous high straight level of of blood level of rapamycin, and they check continuously. They do blood levels to make sure that the nadir or low level doesn't get below a certain low level. So they're keeping it at a high level, and that high level they're keeping at, that prevents your body from making a functional amount of mTOR2. If you don't have a functional amount of mTOR2, it works great for transplant medicine, but it does have sort of some significant sort of like side effects. And of course, it's like, you know, it's not good for. But, uh, insulin resistance is having an adverse effect there. It's having an adverse, a lot of adverse effects. And uh, But the bottom line was those people received no benefit. In other words, they did not have any increased lifespan. The, whatever benefit they had from decreasing mTOR1 was overshadowed by decreasing mTOR2. 
they had the kidney transplant, but they did not get any sort of like beneficial side effects. Uh, so that was how it worked with that. But the problem for rapamycin is uh, that rapamycin got typecast as like a bad guy, is that a million people have used rapamycin in transplant medicine. They've all taken it every day. They have all the size side effects or show rapamycin taken every day is not good for you. Uh, and you look it up in the PDR, you'll have all sorts of side effects. This says rapamycin is like not good for you when you take it every day because it's, it's all the side effects of reducing mTOR2. So based on that, it's very difficult for other people to use it because there's all these side effects and because rapamycin is a generic drug, it's called Cerebus. No one's selling a few hundred million dollars to do clinical studies to show that, like, uh, you know, and they have to start off with like stage one, class one clinical studies, just showing a safe way to use it, just saying using it once a week is safe. And that's not before they can even do anything else. So it's like, and, and people doing studies with it, you can't have it, if you want to have an FDA approved study or like a study that you're listing with clinicaltrials.gov. You can't use it once a week because it's not approved once a week. You'd have to use it every day. But the problem is it doesn't work every day. So they were, they're like stuck because they, they can't, they have to, they can't just say, we're going to use it once a week. It's like, well, it's not approved once a week. You have to prove it, show it's safe to once a week. Well, well, I mean, the idea that, well, if it's safe to give every day, it must be safe to use once a week. Like, no, that's not true. Because <laughs> you could be using a higher dose once a week. You know, like, no, yeah. you have to, you mean, like, with the medicine, you would have, you want to use it different than when it's approved. You have to show that that's a safe way to use it. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you're doing a, a clinical trial, you want to have approved for the FDA, you want to have the, like, list your trials with clinical stuff. You want to have sort of like the, uh, just uh, uh, institutional review board, sort of like if you are okay. They're going to say, well, well that's, you can't do that. Look at all these side effects. We're not a yeah. medical trial. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a catch-22. 20, catch 22. Well, so- yeah, exactly uh, catch-22. And now they're sort of like some of the clinical physicians, they look at it and say, well, we see all these great like, effects in like mice, show us a human trial. Well, that guy, like, we don't, we don't, we don't work on like my studies. Show us a good human study, and then we'll, you know, that'll be good. We'll, then we'll like to see that. Well, then, so, yeah, but as you said, no one's doing a clinic on human study. No one's yeah. paying for it. No one's yeah. paying for human study. So it's like it's very difficult for people to like you know use it if they have don't have a huge amount of experience using it. Although a few yeah. people now are starting to use it in different places, I've heard a lot of different people are, are using. Well, you you have arguably the 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 world's largest experience of clinical use for longevity. I think you you mentioned you you've just had over seven hundred patients now yeah, on rapamycin that in your right. in your practice. And I've been on it for over well, like five years. And I've been on it for like since like you know, like, you know January two thousand sixteen. Uh huh. And you. And specifically, we in your practice, uh, the use is to pulse the dose uh, to uh, activate mTOR. Uh, I'm sorry, to uh, to affect mTOR one, but not affect mTOR two, and that's the whole purpose of that. And that's that's the whole purpose. I always use it just like no more frequent than once a week, mm -hmm. because once once a week is two and a half half lives. There's mm -hmm. like 65 hours. So if you're taking up sort of like a fairly low dose, like six milligrams once a week, by two and a half half lives, the end of the week, you're at a low enough level that's not going to interfere with mTOR2. Uh, but as far as like the other sort of like dose, uh, I have an experiment with, uh, and this was suggested by Blagus Glory. Blagus Glory suggested 20 milligrams. And the, his idea of 20 milligrams was that that was the dose they used in cancer medicine. And like that was a well tolerated dose. And he, he, so he was concerned that it didn't cross, it might not be crossing the blood brain barrier enough. And he wanted to like to have, to have more crossing of the blood brain barrier, he suggested a higher dose and to have a higher dose. So like, I'm, uh, that's what I'm doing now. There's a, 
Now I'm just actually using it. So I've, initially I've been using it for about three years at six milligrams once a week. And then I had a couple of my patients, they were using it at 10 milligrams and they had a very good response. They had, they just on their own, <laughs> on their own, they sort of like, you know, and they said, no, this is working great. So and I told them, oh, well, I would try that. So I had like a higher dose, I went up to 10. And I sort of like a better, felt that a better response at that dose. So I stayed at that dose for like a year or so. And then for the last like four weeks, I've like tried 20 milligrams every other week. Like the idea of 20 milligrams, 20 milligrams is your like seems like a maximum dose, but two weeks is five half-lives. Five half-lives is the theoretical like zero. Like whatever, whatever dose you start off with, by the time five half-lives later, you should be at zero. So if you took 20 milligrams and you waited two weeks, you should be at zero by your new dose. So that should sort of like work out. Yeah, it's just an N of one, but what have you noticed in going from six to 10 to 20, if anything, in your personal experience? 10 was better and like 20 seemed better. 20 better in, in what way? Like what sort of, uh, what, what biomarkers or what did you feel? I lost a few extra pounds on sort of like 10 and I sort of like felt better. And I sort of like definitely like, I like noticed it sort of like, it's sort of like, it's very subtle. But if you sort of like, I could sort of like notice that, yeah, this seems sort of like, like a better dose. I mean, uh -huh. it's just like, uh, it's, it has a lot of side effects. And, but you can sort of like notice the effects. Uh -huh. And when you sort of, uh, what's going on. So I, it seemed to me that, like, yeah, I, that I like that dose better. I like 20 milligrams every two weeks better. For your for your patients, uh, what are the uh, my most... patients? For my patients now, I haven't tried that. I'm still on sort of like yeah. once a week, so I yeah. haven't like on that. I'm still at once a week, and that's sort of like the experimental sort of like stuff. Uh, I'm following Blackett's glory suggestion on that, but I'm sure. still like but most of my, my patients is still on like once a week, and mostly it's once a week. It's six milligrams, and last is a, a very dramatic problems. But as far as rapamycin. But I said it's remarkable for like also losing weight. It's like the world's greatest weight loss drug. Huh. Uh, huh. Uh, and I mean, enough, the number one thing I sort of like measure with everybody is uh, everybody's HOMA IR score. What that stands for is homeostatic model of insulin resistance. So that's the sort of like, uh, it's like insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity. That's the most important thing in being real healthy. And to measure, to get to measure that, you have to measure insulin and then you measure fasting insulin and fasting glucose and you multiply the two together. And that gives you your insulin resistance score. Uh, yeah. because, the, because the insulin is controlling the glucose. So the critical thing is, well, how much insulin do you need to control to, to get this level of glucose? And so you want to know what the insulin is. So you just multiply them together. And then after you multiply them together, you divide by 405, which is the magic number. And then you do that, one is healthy. <laughs> you want to come up with that number. So one is healthy and two is early insulin resistance and three is significant insulin resistance. But if you don't want to do that, you know, there's a very nice website that says home IR score and you just plug in glucose, plug in insulin and push calculate and it comes right. up with your home IR score. So that's something that uh, all, all, every single doctor should always use. They should always measure your insulin and glucose and calculate your home IR score. Absolutely. Fasting insulin is such a powerful marker. Why wait until your glucose becomes elevated? The, the fasting insulin can, can be elevated for 10 years before yeah. the glucose. Well, yeah, well, right. And the idea is that the hemoglobin A1C, that's your average blood sugar. But that only shows when your blood sugar is failing. Like if right. you have a high level of insulin, and you're controlling the blood sugar, you could have a perfectly good hormone, you could have perfectly good hemoglobin A1C, 
but your insulin, your insulin resistance, uh, and your hemoglobin A1C is not up until you're basically now you're failing to control your blood sugar. Now it's going up, but so yeah. it's a late it's a late marker. But the hemoglobin A1C, the Homo IR score, you can calculate that on everybody, and it's just extraordinarily effective. I mean, like very very people are in fantastic shape. They're like under one, and healthy people are around one, and you know, people is a little bit overweight or two, and people feel like significant overweight tend to get into around three. So it's like it's a very very good number that responds very very well. Yeah, yeah. That, of of your patients that that are on the on the six or the ten dose, what what are the most um, the most things they report, both positive findings or side effects that you that you've seen in your practice? Well, a typical report is, and it's just some uh, middle-aged 55-year-old like women physician, and she said the cycling speed went from 15 miles an hour to 18 miles an hour. That's hmm. sort of like a, huh. a, 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 a good response. People, uh -huh. sort of like, people sort of like notice that if they're like, at max performing, at maximum cardiac output. So like cyclists notice that, because cyclists are always at maximum cardiac output. It's sometime in the wake up, either like when they're cruising along or like when they're going up hills or when they're just sort of like lying flat out as fast as they can go. Cyclists know exactly how they're doing. They like, you know, they know exactly what's going on. And if they have better cardiac function, they know it. And so cyclists are like this, the cyclists notice that they have better cardiac function. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other people sort of like notice that if they are at a real sort of like a strenuous activity, that's the way if they sort of like do something that's like really, really challenging and that they could usually do, and they notice they're not sort of like getting short of breath and be able to do that better or like so forth to do something like, you know, go on a big hike or do other stuff. But if you're not sort of like doing very much, if you're not challenging yourself, you don't know, notice much of a change. Now, oh, that's was, interesting. I mean, in other words, you know, if you're just, if you're not doing anything that requires you know, like maximum cardiac output, you know, like, there's, it was like doing things that make you real short of breath. Mm -hmm. and so you can like, you know, but different people might have different things. I mean, if you know, you might, it might just be walking up the steep hill and I was supposed to sort of like, you know, jogging it sort of like tops, like, you know, so forth. But if you like, it tends to improve that. It tends to improve a thing called age-associated cardiomyopathy. Uh, that, now that's the sort of like thing the cardiologists never talk about, but that's the number one thing that like, all the animals die from, right? Basically, that's the universal thing in the animal world. Uh, I mean, they either get cancer or they get age-associated cardiomyopathy. And so it's like a decrease in cardiac function with age. Uh, and that was the thing that like Matt Cable was studying uh, in his dog study in Seattle. And he was showing that when they had like the middle-aged dogs and they gave them rapamycin, they improved their cardiac function. Uh, and he was showing that on echocardiograms. And then huh. another guy called like Day and Lubinowicz, they were like in the same sort of like place in like, you know, Seattle. They were showing, they were doing the same studies on mice. And they showed a dramatic improvement in the mice in the real part. They showed it, interest, interestingly, they showed the same effect on either 40% caloric restriction or rapamycin. And on those sort of like studies, they showed the same kind of like you know, like improved cardiac function. But those guys went even further and they did a complete proteome that they would say like printed out all the like, all the proteins like in the heart muscle. And I saw like 700 and then they could see which ones went up and which ones went down and which ones changed and which changed with aging, and which changed with rapamycin. And they could see that they would have a reversal, but basically it was reversal of the mitochondrial function of the sort of like energy burning function. And yeah, so one thing. It was the energy burning function. It was a shift from all that old hearts were burning glucose and young hearts were burning fat. And they could sort of like, so it was a shift. And basically, 
like the substrate that you were using, like they were using a better fuel. It's like young hearts use burned fats. And that's sort of like, and it's like with deterioration, they're like shifting of the substrate. That's what sort of like they were like showing when they actually like traced it down to what was going on. But they were both showing like a marked improvement of cardiac function with sort of like that mycin. And that's what I say to my patients. The sort of like improvement of heart function uh, and that they have like, they, they basically have an improvement of their age-related decline. In other words, they, they're not going like, if they were like 25, it would, it would have made benefit. But when they're 50, they're getting back some of the, what they've lost in like aging. That's just sort of like what they're doing. Uh, uh, so yeah. that's, that's one thing people notice. And the other thing people notice is they notice, notice a lot less inflammation, like aches and pains and sort of like joint pains and things like that. And people who are having like, a, like degrees of mental foggyness, they notice that they're, they're working, they're doing better mentally, more mental clarity, right? They like feel that they you know, improve it, like better mental function. That's just sort of like the type of things people like notice. People don't notice that Nothing that they didn't get any bad diseases. <laughs> that's that's the, you don't notice that. Like, right. right. You, know, you don't notice that I didn't have a heart attack last week. So, <laughs> you know, that no one notices that. But people notice over like a couple of years that nothing bad happened to them and they're feeling pretty much the same. In other words, they're like that's the typical response. I'm feeling the same. I'm like, it's just, it's like, they didn't get any better, they didn't get any worse, they didn't get any older, they didn't get any diseases. They're like feeling the same. And like, yeah. like feeling the same for like three or four years is like good. That's a good thing, yeah. <laughs> what about, uh, what about uh, untoward effects, uh, side effects, aphthous ulcers? Uh, what, what, what do you see in aphthous your patients? Aphthous ulcers are sort of like, like, tend to be real mild, but much more sort of like serious in the transplant patients because transplant patients can never stop. But if people like people usually never get them after they're taking the drug for sort of like six months. But in the first couple of months, or if they increase the dose, they're likely to get them. But they tend to be very, very small. And like hardly like just like, it's not as much of a problem as something that you notice. It's like a pinpoint little area that you can tell, or you like, you can, you can, like barely feel there's some little thing in your mouth that you can like feel. It's unlikely to get to this, like, I mean, the size of a, an actual sort of like thing you can see or a real sort of sore. But some people get that, but it's usually not a problem because uh, if it's sort of like, you can simply stop taking rapamycin and it like heals in a couple of days or a week. So it like heals real fast when you stop taking rapamycin. Uh, so it's usually it's not much of a problem. Uh, and it's usually, mostly people can take things. So there's a thing called ulcer swish, which is like a, a steroid and a, uh, and a couple of other things that like when they can heal better. But that's usually not much of a problem. It's much more of a problem with the, uh, for the transplant patients because they can, they're on a higher continuous dose so they can't stop and they can't let it heal. But still it is unclear what it is. I think it's an mTOR1 effect. In other words, I think that the sort of like the mTOR1, I think that it's basically been a disease of unknown cause. But I think what's happening is that the mTOR1 is stopping the proliferation of the cells. If it slows down the proliferation of some group of like mucosal cells, then you'll have a little spot where they didn't sort of like patch it, like repair that. I think that's uh -huh. what's going on. But I think over the fact that it just happens in the beginning, and over sort of time, I think the stem cells doing that then get a better function. So I think, but I think, I think it's a, uh, an impaired stem cell function, and I think it's an mTOR1 function. I think the mTOR1 initially is slowing down the function of the stem cells, but then it's sort of like after it's going on for a period of time to take it, now you have a better function of the stem cells because now you're not getting the problem because it's just happening early. But it's, mm -hmm. but it's much more of a trivial kind of thing. So the, the main sort of like uh, serious problem is that it decreases, is, is that a direct effect of mTOR1. It decreases your innate immune system. Now your innate immune system, uh, 
that's decreasing chronic inflammation. That's generally good for most AIDS-related things, but it's not good if you have a bacterial infection. The, the innate immune system is your uh, number one defense against bacterial infections. So when you're taking that, your resistance to bacterial infections is definitely decreased. I mean, I saw like one study in which they had uh, mice on caloric restriction, uh, and then they exposed them to say like a burn. Now they were much more likely to die because they were like the caloric restriction is depressing their innate immune system. So that would probably be a problem if it wasn't for the fact that we have like a new miracle drug called antibiotics. So it turns out that like with rapamycin and antibiotics, you're a lot better off fighting a bacterial infection than no rapamycin and no antibiotics. Uh, so uh, as long as people have antibiotics on hand or access to antibiotics, Anything that's suspicious for bacterial infection, if you take antibiotics, it clears up within a couple of hours. It just sort of like immediately clears up. So it's, but if you did not have, if you sort of like the taking rapamycin and you didn't take antibiotics and you had a cough and you didn't take it and you kept on going and you just figured, well, I've had coughs before, they get better. You could wind up in the hospital for a moment. So it's real important to figure that you have rapamycin your innate immune system fighting a bacterial infection is decreased. And if you have anything like a cough that could be a bacterial infection, you should take an antibiotic like zithromycin. Uh, and then whatever you have uh, caused the bacterial infection, it'll clear up very, very fast. Oh, so, yeah. that, that, so I would say that's the main sort of like thing. Uh, as far as uh, the other type of side effects is there's a transient increase in uh, lipids. Uh, but that's not sort of like, that's not a dangerous effect. Because with usually if your LDL and so forth went up, it would seem like you had an increased risk. But with rapamycin, you're not at an increased risk because you're decreasing, the, the, the lipids are leaving the tissue as opposed to entering the tissues. It's decreasing the ability to enter. It's decreasing the like, ability to be oxidized and it's decreasing inflammation. So they did uh, various like uh, uh, studies with like polio disease or atherosclerosis. It didn't matter that they had, like the animals could have real high cholesterol levels. The cholesterol is still leaving the tissues and the lesions were clearing up. So the lesions were clearing up regardless of what the blood level was. So, so if like rapamycin, the blood level that would be dangerous if you weren't on rapamycin, is much less dangerous if you're taking rapamycin. But if you can always sort of like just add a statin to it, if it's sort of like, uh, if it's like elevated, and it's usually that effect tends to be transient. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I would say that's not too much of a problem. And generally for the most part, uh, it might, it, it has the effect on insulin to like lower insulin. And you, the idea is like to balance that off you're supposed to like lower insulin and improve your insulin sensitivity and like lose weight. If you simply lower insulin and you didn't do anything to your insulin sensitivity, you're like insulin, you're like uh, glucose could go up a little bit. But for the most part, it's having people, the net effect for most people is improving their insulin sensitivity because they're like, their insulin is going down and their insulin resistance is going down. And, uh, and so it's having, you want to have those two effects, low insulin, improve insulin sensitivity. But yeah. most, so then you want to have that. But I would yeah. say it's an it's a extraordinarily good drug for preventing diabetes because type two diabetes, because it's a very good drug for losing weight. People like to lose, like on rapamycin, people can lose like, you know, the extra weight and become insulin sensitive and totally reverse insulin resistance in, in like type two diabetes. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is a fascinating experience you, you have. Um, if it's all right with you, uh, this, this has been so useful and so fascinating. I, I'd love to invite you, I'd love to take the uh, desatinib discussion and the senolytics. And if it's all right with you, I'd, I'd like to invite you back 
again to spend a whole segment on Senolytics, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. And and um, and this time, uh, before we go today, just uh, uh, you already mentioned your your current regimen of uh, rapamycin, and um, and then we'll talk about the Senolytics, I guess, next time. Do you can you share with us any of your choices about uh, diet? Um, any particular fasting that you do or any exercise or other lifestyle things that you do? Well, as far as like exercise, I like suggest people like at an hour of walking three or four times a week. Uh, I think that's sort of like very, very important. Uh, as far as the number one thing I think people should do is uh, they need like a tape measure and measure the waistline. <laughs> and, and you, if, you're, if you're five foot 10, and 70 inches tall, your waistline should not be over half your height. Your waistline should be 35 inches. So I think that's the only sort of like diagnostic test you need is a tape measure. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, as far as the diet, I don't do any fast. I think fasting is good because it lowers like mTOR. Uh, so like, but as far as like a diet, the diet that I like to try to be on that I'd recommend is a low methionine diet. Uh, it turns out that like methionine is a very strange amino acid. It's codone one for every amino for every protein made by every sort of like uh, like uh, you can everything that has the nucleus. It's every time they make a protein, position number one is methionine. So if your body is low in methionine, it thinks, well, we better not be like it's, it's the same as caloric restriction. Or you better might be turning things down rather than methionine. And methionine is uh, so a low methionine diet is pretty much a vegan diet. It's like that's what is methionine is high in like fish and chicken and like beef and eggs, but it's low in most vegetables. So like a, uh, so like if you're eating like a basically vegan diet, you're eating a low methionine diet. That's sort of like very similar to a caloric restriction diet. I see. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, they had when they did a study on sort of like rats. They had rats living forty percent longer, longer on just a low methionine diet. So that's the oh. sort of like thing I like about the diet. And also, I like a diet that's sort of like low in what Helen Flissara called advanced glycation end products. They're the things you sort of like get when you like cook meats at a high temperature. And like grilling and flying and so forth. They're the things that make get foods taste great. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> That's right. It's a balance, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alan, for spending time with us. And and I'm I'm really looking forward to our next session when we when we talk about senolytics and the great work you're doing there. But I I just want to. Uh, thank you for your time today and uh, sharing the, the beautiful things you, you're doing yeah, with your one, patients. One other thing I sort of like noticed is that you squeeze it about San Antonio, Texas is now treating people with early Alzheimer's disease and like MCI, Cinelytics to stop them. And I expect, based on this sort of like the study that I mentioned, I expect them to get very, very good results in that. And the sooner as people start the treatment, the better. Great, great. All right. Well, thank, thank, thank you again for taking the time to be on the program, and I look forward to uh, speaking with you again soon. Uh, if, I, if I put in one last thing, sure. I should go to Twenty Three and Me and get genetic testing done. What SNPs think, in particular to look for? Everyone will need to know if they have a gene for APOE four. Twenty percent of the people are E four positive. They're 50% of the cases of Alzheimer's disease. They're three times more likely that uh, 10, five or 10 years to your onset. That's the people who sort of like are at risk. People have to know they're at risk so they can take proactive steps to prevent it because it's very preventable if you know you're at risk. Great. I, I, I love that. And we'll link to uh, 23andMe and also uh, we'll put the links to the SNPs in there so if people want to do their own searches on after they download their data. We'll show them how to do that as well. Okay, great. Very great. good. Thanks. Thanks again, Alan. It was great talking with you. All right, okay, bye. No, this is not intended to be a substitute for.
professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking of it because of something you have seen here. If you find this to be of value of you, please hit that like button and subscribe to support the work we do on this channel. Also, we take your suggestions and advice very seriously. Please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we we'll hope to see you next time.